All right, hey guys, welcome to lesson 10. Numero uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez, diez. Numero diez, uh, also known as Genesis 22. Look, man, I took five years of Spanish, you guys. You're horrible at it. It paid off. I had to count in my head out loud. Nailed it. I nailed it. So, yes, I'm here joined in the studio, the warehouse studio with Rich, Kevin, Jeff, TJ, and myself. And we are on lesson 10, and we are plowing through the book of Genesis, Genesis 1 through 50. Can you imagine that over the course of two years, we are going to study Genesis all the way to Revelation 730, oh, 730 lessons. Anybody else want to pass out? 130 what? Oh. <laughs> so, here, look, all I know is this is that our goal for the book of Genesis is to emphasize one word. So you're like, look, I can't remember 730 lessons. That's okay. We want to take you deeper with the word of God, but we also want to simplify it. And so that first word from the first book of Genesis, 66 books, is the first one that we want to emphasize, okay, is seed. Is that the seed of serpent and the seed of the woman is constantly at battle. We've seen this now, literally Genesis 1 through 21. 21 chapters, and we've seen this so evident through Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Now they're having a, a, a son named Isaac and Ishmael. Even though he's still going to be blessed, he was sent off. And so you have this tension. And so as a result of this tension, as, as a result of all of these things that are going on, uh, God just continues to show up to Abraham. I think it's the best. He just keeps showing up in Beersheba in Genesis 21, uh, verse 31 through 32 about this well and the covenant. And then, and then I love this. Abraham even plants a, a, a tree and then he, he gives an offering to Yahweh and the everlasting God. And yet in verse 34, Kevin, if you would, Genesis 21, verse 34, it says this. And it talks about Abraham's lifestyle and, and how he's perceived. In Genesis 21, 34, just go backwards one more verse if you would. <laughs> just this way. Abraham lived as a foreigner in the land of the Philistines for many days. Abraham never had a home. He was constantly on the move. In fact, we call this revived school. I would call Abraham a school of faith. He constantly was walking by faith. And to me, that's what set aside Abraham than anybody else. Remember Lot, he was sitting at the gate of, of Sodom and that, that had become his house. He, in fact, he even had a house in Sodom, which we know Sodom and Gomorrah are whoop, gone. They're destroyed. But Abraham just keeps moving, living as a foreigner. Uh, and in fact, in the land of the Philistines. And so that's, that's the, where we're going to in Genesis 22, verse one. It says, after these things, after all of these things, Genesis 22, verse one, after these things, after all this that Abraham's been going through, God decided to test Abraham. And he said to Abraham, and I love this, and he says, here I am. His first response, Abraham is so in tune with God. He doesn't do the little Samuel and say, who's talking to me to Eli? He says, is that you talking to me? Abraham right away goes, I'm here. Here I am. And I love this because he is in tune. Now, I just want to talk about this, this testing mentality, okay? Testing is not a temptation, okay? So testing and temptations are different. How, though? How is testing different than temptation? That's kind of a simple question, but what do you think Satan did? Satan tempted Adam and Eve. Is God ever going to tempt us with sin? I don't, I don't think, that sounds really weird to me. So don't think God is tempting Abraham. God is testing him. Now, I also want to understand, okay, a temptation is, is that it comes from a desire within. Okay, so there's a temptation that something's creeping up with inside of you. Now, a test or a trial, I like that word trial. You'll see that in scripture as well. A trial is that it comes from the Lord with a specific purpose to fulfill. So God is going to test Abraham. He's going to, he's going to put him through a trial and Abraham is always willing. He says, here I am. Now watch, this, this is ridiculous, you guys. Think about this. Abraham has been tested and, and he has given up more than anybody at this point. And in fact, Dr. Tom Constable, he gave six different illustrations about all that Abraham has gone through. First of all, he left his homeland, right? In Genesis 12, but God gave him a new one. We also know that he left his extended family. And then God said, I'm gonna give you a much larger family. And then it says, I, I, I want you to, I'm going to give you the best land to your nephew. Who's his nephew, Kevin? Do you remember? Lot. Yes. So he gives the best land to Lot, but then guess what happens? God gives Abraham more land. Every time he's tested, God shows up. And in fact, I, I'm going to give you, this is an interesting one. Uh, 
he gave up the king said, uh, a king's reward. Remember a king offered him a reward and he goes, no, no, I can't take this reward. I, I need it to come from the Lord. And so then when he said no to that reward from a human king, God gave him more wealth than he could ever imagine. And then remember, he gave up Ishmael. We talked about this last week in Genesis 21. Here you go. I, I need to give up my son Ishmael. But then what did he do? Ishmael became a father of, of, of many nations. And so God still blessed Ishmael. And then one other thing of this testing or this trial or the sacrifice is that what we're going to see in Genesis 22, he's, he's asked to give up his son, Isaac. The one that comes through Genesis uh, 12, he's now saying, I, I want you to give up your son, Isaac. And yet we're going to, I'm just going to tell you the end result because he does give up Isaac and because God honors what he does, God then uses Isaac to give Abraham a numerous seed. And I love this, Dr. Con Tom Constable he said, though, when you go through a sacrifice or a time of a testing, it will always lead to more. And I don't necessarily mean more testing and trials. I mean more of Him, more of the Lord. And I think that's why I'm excited about these two years. That's why I'm also really nervous. I'm like, I God, I know this is going to be hard, but I also know on the back end, my prayers, I, I look a whole lot more like Christ. And so in Genesis, if you would, Genesis 22 in verse 2, this is what, after, after Abraham said, here I am, God says, oh good, now, now I'm going to use him. I want, I want you to take your son, Isaac, your only son, whom you love, and I want you to go to the land of Moriah, and I want you to offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. I would process this to death and be like, uh, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't equal Genesis 12, 13, 15, 17, 18, 21. It doesn't equal the seed of the woman, the seed of Christ. You want me to kill my son? Like as a burnt offering? You know what a burnt offering means? Like you kill him as an offering to the Lord. None of this logically makes sense. Interesting, the word Moriah, the, the land of Moriah, it, it means where the Lord provides or where the Lord appears. It's right around Jerusalem. It's about 45 miles north of Beersheba. And in fact, this is the same place that God appeared to David when he built an altar. It's the same thing where Solomon built his temple and the same place where Christ possibly died. This land of Moriah this place where God appears, where God provides over and over again in Abraham and in David and in Solomon and in Christ, you see God showing up. The question is, is will we walk by faith to get to that point? Will we accept what he wants us to go through? I mean, let's face it, he loves Isaac. I was thinking about, actually, because I've been studying through this text about Jude is my only son, my, my little buddy here. And It'd be the weirdest thing if God said, hey, I want you to go sacrifice your son. Like if this is in the old days, like, my first third thought is, yeah, right. I think every one of us would be like, I, I don't, I'm sorry. Do you know how long I waited for this, this offspring? <laughs> Hello, 100 years old, my wife, she's super old. And now you want me to give up my son? <laughs> it's true. I even used a filter on that one right there. <laughs> Kyle, what I, I love about this scripture is God tells him one day and it says, early the next morning. So God tells him to kill his son and then he doesn't hesitate even one day. Great, great transition in verse three. So Abraham, no debate necessary, no committee meetings. No, hey, Sarah, what do you think about this? <laughs> hey, let's go to Lot. Nobody's gonna want this guy, but now watch this. It says he saddled his donkey. He got up early. He took with him two of his young men and his son, Isaac. So they got a party of three, Isaac, two, and, his, and the dad. He split wood for a burnt offering, set out to go to the place God had told him. Now, <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys, can you believe this? The only way that I know that Abraham has radical faith is you have to go to Hebrews eleven nineteen. 19. All right, Kevin, go to Hebrews eleven nineteen 19. Because Abraham actually believed that it was, it was going to be okay. It says he considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. And so he got him back as an illustration. So I don't know if in Abraham's heart with his two young men and his son Isaac and all of this wood... He's like, oh yeah, God can bring him back from the dead. He hasn't seen somebody come back from the dead in, in, the, in the Old Testament yet. Not, it's not like we have these illustrations of Lazarus coming back to the dead or Christ at that time coming back from the dead. He just believed that God could do this. That is the kind of faith that I want to have. And I, I love this. And so I believe he, he's holding on to this. Now, this is cool. Warren Wiersbe, he says, in one sense, it's a compliment when God sends us a test. 
It shows that God wants to promote us in the school of faith. And that's exactly how Abraham believed. He's promoting God. He knew God was going to promote him in the school of faith. He knew he was going to look more like Christ. Man, to me, this is exciting. This is exhilarating. And so on verse four, watch this. It says, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Praise God. <laughs> like I'm walking with my son, right? You know, it's, it's kind of funny to me. I'm walking with uh, these two visitors or my two, two helpers, these visitors. That's like the angels all the time, right? No angels in the scene yet, okay? So they're walking and he sees the place in the distance. So three days of knowing that you're going to kill your son. There's plenty of time to back out. In fact, how many of us do we know people that know they've been called, that know they heard from the Lord, and then what do they do? They back out. I believe God's giving Abraham ample time to really believe, do you believe that I've called you to do this? It gets a pretty powerful image. And on the third day, Abraham doesn't resist. In fact, he embraces faith. In Genesis 22, verse 5, it says, Then Abraham, watch this, This guy is just like, he's the stud of faith. Abraham said to his young men, those two guys, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I, okay, Isaac, okay, now we'll get into the age thing maybe here in a little bit. Josephus says that the the, the great uh, historian, Josephus says that he was probably 25 years old. Most other folks would say 15 or 16. I don't know, 15 to 25. Either way, the dude probably could take Abraham out. (laughs) You know, like, hey, he's an old, old guy. Let's just kick the can for him. But like, I think there's something this, something there. So he says to the young men, you guys stay here. The boy and I will go over to the worship, there to worship, and then we're going to come back. He actually believes that him and his son are coming back. But what is he going to do? He's going to kill his son. He's going to offer his son to God. And he tells these young men, I don't know if he said it with trembling. I don't know if he said it with emotion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna, we'll be back in a little bit. <laughs> That's nuts, man. That's crazy. And I love this, though. Uh, Warren Wearsby, my, my buddy back here who writes some of these commentator, taters? Oh, there they are again. Commentators, commentators. are back. Oh, Lord. Some ketchup. I got to stop watching myself some cars, one, two, and three, right, Mater? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now watch this, okay? I hope this makes sense because it makes sense to me in my head. Abraham, okay, this is what Wearsby says. Abraham believed God and obeyed him when he didn't know where? Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, when he was called, he obeyed and went to a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Part of the test is it, it doesn't, you don't know the end. You don't know where you're going. And I love this. Abraham believed God and obeyed him when he didn't know when. The test sometimes is you want to spell it out, but it doesn't always work like that. And in verse 9, if you would go there, Kevin, verse 9 and 10, It just says, by faith he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the promise. Verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. You guys, go back to verse 9 if you don't mind, Kevin. He he doesn't know when he's moving on. He's a foreigner. He's constantly moving. He has no three to five year game plan. And so he's believing and he is obeying God, even though when he doesn't know when, uh, what, what this looks like. All right. He believes in God and obeyed him when he didn't know, you ready for this one? How it unfolds. Okay, how it unfolds. In verse 11, Hebrews 11, verse 11, by faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. I don't know how this is going to work, God. You, are you seriously, this offspring is going to come from my old wife? Right? That, that's, that's, what it, that's what this test is. And the test continues. Okay, go on to the next one. He believed God and obeyed him, Wearsby says, even when he didn't know why. Verse 17. So this test, you know, that we want all the answers to of where, when, how, and why. By faith, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. I'm pretty sure at that point, Abraham didn't know why. Why would you ask me to kill my only son that apparently the seed is going to come through? You want me But that's the test. We don't always have to know the where, the when, the how, and the why. We don't have to always know that, but we want to. And so therefore, we just sit in our comfortable chairs and say, forget that. I'm not walking by faith. Who sits like that anyway, by the way? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, man. I'm just telling you this. This is interesting to me, though. And so in verse 6 of Genesis 22, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he laid it on his son Isaac. 
in his hand, he took the fire and the sacrificial knife, and the two of them walked on together. Hey, Isaac, I got, I got, I got something I need you to do. Uh, I need you to hold this. I need you to hold this wood. And Oh, by the way, in his hand, he took the fire. He held the actual item, and then the two of them walked. Did anybody else find this weird? I'm telling you what, it's the craziest thing, and I know this is a drastic picture, and you're like, well, that's not necessarily the case, but when I think about the knife, I, th I think about Christ and the cross. And I, I know that on the Villa de Via Della Rosa, I get that like he didn't always carry the cross. I remember he had somebody else that carried it for him, but I, I picture like somebody carrying the actual weapon that's going to kill Christ. I know, sin put us on the cross. You get the point, you put him on the cross. But my point is, is like they're walking and here's this illustration. Death is coming and, and Abraham, he's not even faced. If he is, Moses isn't telling us. And in verse seven, then Isaac, he spoke to his father, Abraham, he said, my father. And he replied, here I am, my son. That, that's, that's Abraham's line. <laughs> here I am. And Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, good God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. God will provide. The land of Moriah, the Lord appears, the Lord provides. Remember David, the altar, Solomon in the temple, and Jesus in his death. God is going to provide, and Abraham set the example as faith. He didn't matter where, when, how, or why. He's just going to do it. And in verse 9 of Genesis 22, 9, it says, When they arrived at the place that God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac, and he placed him on the altar on top of the wood. I, I don't know. Hey, it's, it's okay, Isaac. Just relax. It's fine. It's not a big deal. It's fine. God's going to show up. I mean, yeah, right. Like, that's the first thought. Man, I have all kinds of thoughts. Um, this is crazy, you guys. And I, I want to read this. A uh, commentator, Hamilton, says this. If Abraham displays faith that obeys, watch this, then Isaac displays faith that cooperates. That's right. Yep. So what happens is that when you are tested, Abraham's faith begins to rub off on his son Isaac. If Isaac was strong and big, big enough, Hamilton says, to carry wood for a sacrifice, maybe he was strong and big enough to resist and subdue his father, but he chose not to. He chose to cooperate by faith. I believe Isaac heard the prophetic words that said, hey, by the way, you're the offspring. I believe he knew about this, and so... He's just going to trust his dad that his faith is that radical that God's going to show up. And in verse 10, then Abraham reached out and he took the knife to slaughter his son. Not just like kill him, but slaughter. An offering is a slaughter. Man, but the angel of the Lord in verse 11 called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and then classic Abraham's line. Here I am. <laughs> like, this is all we hear from Abraham, but I got to tell you, he's doing it. Yeah, here I am, God. Thanks for showing up finally. <laughs> and all I know is that there's a sense of urgency when the angel of the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham. Okay, Kevin, get your typing things ready, okay? I need you to go to Genesis 46, 2. You're going to see this constant theme of God speaking. And then it says, that night God spoke to Israel in a vision. Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Jacob replied, here I am. Now watch this, Exodus 3, 4. Let's go to the life of Moses. Exodus 3, 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, uh, Moses, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And what does Moses say? Here I am. So there's this urgency of God intervening and his servants responding. 1 Samuel 3, 10, watch this, continues to build. It's just a cool study of God showing up. 1 Samuel 3, 10, the Lord came, stood there and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel responded, speak for your servant is listening. I, it doesn't, it's not as exciting, is it? Because he doesn't say, here I am. <laughs> but he's implying, I'm, I'm here. And then if you would, go to Acts 9, 4. Let's go to the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah. Let's go to what Scripture says. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Every time you see this double, uh, um, the name saying being said twice. Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, Moses, Moses, Samuel, Samuel, Saul, Saul. You're seeing God intervene at critical points of each one of these men's walk with faith, walk of faith. And I, I think it's just a cool picture. And then in verse 12, then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you are legit. 
Isn't that awesome? What it's translation? It. It's the amplified version. <laughs> For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. I, I have to ask, and I don't know, maybe you guys can comment on this. Do you think this is the moment that God says, wow, he's really, he really believes this promise? He says, for now I know you fear God. Now I know if you're willing to give up your only son, I actually believe <laughs> you trust me. The commentator Roop, he says this, an obedience which does not protect even what is most precious, but trusts God with the future. That's what happens. He, obedience is so radical. What, I, I'm not holding on to anything anymore. I'm not holding on to my marriage, my kids, my finances, my house. God, if you're asking me to do this, I fear you and nothing else. Um, since you're willing to do that, <laughs> faith is no longer just words to Abraham. It's full on action. And Kevin, if you would go to James 2, verse 21, and this kind of proves it all. James 2, verse 21. I, I just love, to me, you guys, this is just fresh for me. It says, when it wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar in verse 22? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. It's one thing to say you believe in God. It's another thing to have faith and walk it out. And I can't think of a better example in Scripture than Abraham willing to give up his son just because God told him to. And then in verse 13, praise the Lord, the land of Moriah shows up, Jehovah Jireh, 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 Jehovah Jireh, Jireh, Jireh. Tater. Tater, totter. Mater, tomato, tomato. <laughs> oh man, this is like the highlight. I just killed it all. Genesis twenty-two thirteen. 13. Abraham looked up, saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horn, horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. You just want to say, praise God. Like his son Isaac was supposed to be the burnt offering, but now all of a sudden this ram, oh, by the way, that's just caught over here. That's the burnt offering. And then in verse 14, you see this, you guys, and Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. So today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. <laughs> Man. Over and over again, this mountain of the Lord is referenced in the Psalms, in Isaiah. This is the mountain of the Lord where God shows up. And when does he show up? That's a great question. He shows up always in time of need. Abraham needed God to show up. And in Hebrews, Kevin, if you would, Hebrews 4 verse 16. I think this is a simple illustration for all of us to have this mentality of how God responds. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. This is how I picture Abraham right here, with boldness. God, you told me to do this. I'm going to walk to the land of Moriah. I'm going to take three days. I'm going to tell my two friends, by the way, can you stay back? We'll, we'll be right back. Because he actually believed that God was going to raise uh, Isaac back to life if he did kill him. But either way, he didn't have to because God showed up. He provided a ram. He provided a ram in the thicket. And I love this in verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord in Genesis 22 called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And in verse 16, he said, By myself I have sworn. This is the Lord's declaration. This is awesome. Because you have done this thing and not withheld your only son. Here it is again. I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the gates. Interesting, isn't it? The gates. There's the gates. You think of gates differently now. Possess the gates of their enemies. Remember, Abraham was spared from Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, Lot was actually spared because of Abraham. I indeed, in verse 17, will bless you. Uh, and make your offspring as numerous as the stars. I got to read this again. In the sky and the sand on the seashore. Watch. Your offspring will possess the gates of your enemies. Oh, by the way, because of your obedience, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, your sacrifice, I'm going to give you more. Remember at the very beginning, more, Lord. When we give up of ourselves, he says, I'm going to give you more. And in verse 18, scripture just says, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. Man, that's awesome. Now, I have to just say this. We know that this picture of Isaac being the sacrificial lamb is, is a beautiful picture. It's a foreshadowing. It's a, a picture 
of what Christ does for us. And in John 1, verse 29, I think we've all heard this passage, but remember, Jesus is interacting with disciples. And in John 1, 29, it's a, it's a simple picture, but the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This Lamb that will take it all away. This Lamb is going to be the sacrificial offering. Sin will go away because of the seed of Christ that was actually planted, yep, into Abraham that went through Sarah, went to Isaac, and because Abraham was willing to give up his, his one and only son, God says, good, now I'm going to bless you, and we're going to keep this thing going. All because of obedience. Now, I want to just close out with this on this faith. I'm going to go to the board, and there's a lot here, but I think it's fair to say that the seed continues now. And there's four types. Dr. Tom Constable says there's, there's four types of seed. And I think this is just a cool picture of the seed that we keep talking about. One is, is that you're going to have this natural seed, okay? Natural seed implies that this is any physical descendants of Abraham. So Isaac would actually be a natural seed. Make sense? Make sense? That sounds kind of obvious, but it's actually from his physical lineage, okay? Now, watch this. Then you have, I'm going to run out of room here. You have the natural spiritual seed, okay? Constable says this, these are believing physical descendants of Abraham, okay? Does that make sense? So you have physical descendants, which are like Ishmael, okay? But then you have natural spiritual descendants that are Isaacs. Everybody with me? In the physical lineage, but they also believe. Now you also have in number three, another type of seed that started from Abraham uh, really in the seed of the woman, that went all the way to the seed of Christ, is, is that you're just going to have a spiritual seed. So when we're talking seed language, okay, I want under, everybody to understand there's layers to the seed. You have natural seeds that come just from Abraham. Then you have natural descendants that also believe. And then you have descendants like us that I'm not a Jewish person. I'm not Hebrew, but I have spiritual connection. And those are non-physical descendants of Abraham. You guys with me on this? Okay, I, I, does this help? I think this is a cool picture here. You have physical, natural, spiritual, and then you have just spiritual. So I'm not actually connected, but because of my spiritual connection through the seed of Christ. And then the ultimate seed, which is kind of the one that's obvious, uh, you just got to just say the ultimate seed is Christ himself. In Galatians 3.16, Kevin, if you would, go there. And you have multiple verses that could back up all of this here, Just, uh, but for time we're not going to. In Galatians 3.16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as though referring to many, but referring to one and to your seed, who is Christ. The end goal for Abraham is it starts here, but as it goes on through the book of Genesis, it's always going to point to the ultimate seed, which is Christ. Genesis 22, there is a lot here. <laughs> but my prayer is that when you have a, a thought, well, I, I shouldn't do that. Why would I do that? that? That seems weird. Like if it doesn't contradict the word of God, then just walk it out by faith and see how God responds because he might want to fulfill something through you. And so I just want to say thanks for jumping in with lesson 10, Genesis 22. You guys are doing great. My prayer is that you'll continue to dig into the word every morning, every evening. And as a result, we'll all look more like Christ. Thanks.